Scott Schluter is a senior biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the New York Field Office, and he leads the Fish Enhancement Mitigation and Research Fund program. His work focuses on restoring native fish species and their habitat in the St. Lawrence River, including over 25 years of sturgeon conservation efforts. And his presentation will focus on the history and recovery efforts of Lake Sturgeon in Northern New York. So I will turn it over to you, Scott. All right, so um, thanks, John. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, bear with me here for just a second while we get fired up. And, um, I am not allowed to use uh, Zoom with the federal government, so it might take just a minute here to get, um, get queued up. All right, so you're seeing that all right, John? Excellent. All right, so thanks again. Um, hang on just a second here. All right, thanks again. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm pleased to be here today to share part of the, the Lake Sturgeon story here in New York. Um, as John said, my name's Scott Schluter. Uh, I'm a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologist and the program manager for the Fish Enhancement Mitigation and Research Fund, and I'll explain that shortly. Um, I've been involved in Lake Sturgeon recovery in New York uh, since the mid-90s, um, almost from the very start. So a quick overview of, of what I'll cover today. Uh, Jennifer Hayes of National Geographic was gonna go, was gonna co-present this talk, but she had a conflict come up, uh, but sends her best wishes. Um, she did send along a video uh, and a bunch of pictures that I've kind of seeded throughout my talk. Uh, you'll clearly be able, they're labeled, but you'll clearly be able to tell which ones are, are mine uh, versus hers. Uh, the video I think sets a great tone. So we'll lead off with that. Um, it takes us underwater with the sturgeon. Um, and I hope it helps you gain an appreciation uh, for this incredible species in a way that you know, my description simply cannot. Um, you'll see them, uh, you'll get to see them spawning on artificial, uh, artificial spawning bed in the St. Lawrence River uh, that was constru constructed by the New York Power Authority as part of relicensing. Um, you'll see how well they're built for their environment. I mean, just a quick short video, um, you can see in this video that they're in an area, just so you know, you wouldn't know it looking at it, but they're in a water, an area where the water flow is about three feet a second. You can see they just, they just sit there uh, with very little effort. And, and then uh, Jen takes us, uh, just kind of highlights uh, the egg take and the fingerling release, and, and it's pretty nice. Um, so then I'll highlight the femref uh, background. And then we'll cover species biology, uh, history and population collapse. And then we can cover some of the restoration efforts and the benchmarks we use. So the next thing here is the video. And let's hope we can get this to play. If, any, if we have issues, John, um, give me a holler here. Scott, is there a soundtrack with it? There is. You're not hearing that? Um, it's beautiful video. Yeah, it's just some background music. Okay. There's no uh, voiceover or anything. That's fine. This must be the release. Yep, yep. Um, it's, it's the, uh, the ended there with, uh, that was right at uh, Hawkins Point there in Messina uh, with fish swimming out of a fish basket, uh, heading up, 
Um, so I hope you enjoyed that video. Um, Jen and, and David do incredible work. Um, and, and again, I, I hope that helps kind of gain an appreciation until you see one of these things in their environment. Um, it's hard to kind of fully appreciate them. Um, so now I'd like to give you a kind of a brief overview of the Fish Enhancement Mitigation and Research Fund, um, or FEMREF for short. Um, and this is what essentially funds me and, and what I spend all my time working on. So it, it resulted from a $24 million settlement with the New York Power Authority uh, for relicensing of the St. Lawrence Power Project. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service manages the fund, um, and we have a fish, uh, fisheries advisory committee and an eel working group that help uh, guide you know, how this money's spent. Um, and by the letter of the law here, um, the purpose of the FEMREF is to benefit the fisheries resources in Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River Basin uh, and continue research on the American eel and other species that may be affected by the project. Um, so the funding provided um, from NIPA is for these focal species. And, and you know, obviously today we're gonna focus on lake sturgeon and for that species, uh, the New York Field Office provides funding and manpower uh, to assist DEC in many aspects of the sturgeon recovery. Um, so this includes um, providing funding to our Fish and Wildlife Service Genoa National Fish Hatchery to assist with raising sturgeon fingerlings um, for the recovery effort. So I wanna state uh, clearly uh, up front that the sturgeon restoration effort in New York is a team sport. Um, we have a close-knit group of dedicated partners that all work together, and our successes to date um, are a result of that. Um, so I'm presenting today, but I'm representing the work of this um, overall collaborative team. So let's talk about sturgeon in New York. So we have three species overall. Uh, today we're focusing on lake sturgeon, um, which is state listed as threatened. It currently has no federal listing, uh, even though it's, um, it's currently under petition uh, to be listed. And um, that'll be reviewed in the next couple, next year or two, um, and a finding will come out. Um, the other two species are short-nosed sturgeon and Atlantic sturgeon. Uh, those both live um, down in the Hudson River. Uh, and they're both um, listed federally under the Endangered Species Act as endangered. So the short-nosed sturgeon um, is our smallest sturgeon in New York. Um, it's kind of a brackish water specialist and rarely enters salt water. Uh, it gets about four and a half feet long and stays under 50 pounds or so. Uh, and the Atlantic sturgeon um, is our largest. Uh, they reach lengths of over 14 feet uh, and weights over 800 pounds. They do enter salt water, but then make those migrations back up the Hudson um, to spawn. So where do lake sturgeon fall? They fall kind of in the middle of those two species, both for length and weight. Um, so as far as lake sturgeon distribution, these two figures show uh, both North America um, and here in New York State. Um, so uh, in North America, they occur in the Great Lakes, um, you know, all the Great Lakes. Um, they occur in the Mississippi River, the Missouri River, the Tennessee Rivers. Uh, and then up to the north, um, they occur in tributaries that flow into James Bay and Hudson Bay up in Canada. You know, so here in New York, they occur in both our Great Lakes and our connecting channels. So um, Lake Erie, the Niagara River, uh, Lake Ontario, the St. Lawrence River, uh, they do occur in Lake Champlain at, at very low numbers. Uh, and then they occur in tributaries to the system, uh, including, you know, up the Oswego River uh, system kind of inland to Oneida Lake, the Cuba Lake. So as far as their biology, uh, they are, um, you know, one of the longest lived fishes. Um, they can reach ages of over 100 years. I believe the record is 154. Um, they get big. Um, a lake sturgeon can get over seven feet and up to 300 pounds. Um, they make these, they are migratory. They make these upstream movements for spawning. Um, another word for that is patadromous, that, that they live completely within fresh water and go from one water body to another to spawn. Um, usually up a river, um, but can be kind of moving from one section of a river to kind of a riffle area to spawn. Um, they occupy high quality habitat. Um, so well oxygenated water they need. Um, they spawn in moving water over cobble and gravel, a clean um, cobble and gravel um, that's not been impacted by sediment. So they are prehistoric fishes. Um, and even though they belong to the kind of bony fish family, uh, they are mostly cartilage, like sharks. 
Uh, they have smooth skin um, covered with denticles. That's like a shark skin. Uh, if you handle them a lot, uh, you get what we call sturgeon burn. Um, it feels much like uh, shark skin and your arms will get all red and you wonder, it starts hurting and you wonder what the heck happened. Um, they have five rows of bony scutes uh, in addition to those denticles. Um, they have four barbels that help them locate food and we'll show you some more pics of those. Um, they have these big suctioning kind of fleshy mouths that um, can kind of hoover up the food or prey items. Uh, they have grinding plates that they can crush food and they can actually crush, crush muscle shells. Um, they're benthic or bottom feeders. So they eat primarily aquatic insects and snails and mussels. They eat very few fish, um, but they are, are opportunistic. Um, so they do, you know, we know that when there's been, been um, you know, die offs of um, certain species, we, we, you know, the sturgeon take advantage of those. Obviously, they're not chasing down a, a shiner in, in open water, um, but they do take advantage of that. Uh, more recently, gobies. Um, if you stick your head underwater uh, with a mask on, you know that uh, there's a goby under every other rock. And I think, uh, you know, gobies are starting to show up more in the diet. We don't know if they're selecting for those or they're just kind of kind of hoovering up uh, aquatic insects and, and get a bonus goby. Um, we're not quite sure. So here's just an example to, show, to share. This is from a, a diet analysis from Oneida Lake. Um, so in general, um, I just wanna impress that sturgeon eat low on the food chain, right? When you have this much biomass out there, obviously they're not top end predators and they wouldn't be able to sustain. So they feed lower on that food chain. So this entire circle represents 100% of the sturgeon diet uh, in Oneida Lake. Um, so if you break up those wedges, um, their diet comprised, is comprised of 21% snails, um, 28% freshwater shrimp. So those are the amphipods and isopods. Um, aquatic insects make up 18%, uh, caddisflies, mayflies, and chironomids. And that makes up um, a lot of uh, what the sturgeon eat in the St. Lawrence. And then in Oneida Lake, uh, they found that for adult sturgeon, that 32% of their diet is made up of zebra mussels. Um, so they are eating zebra mussels. And again, this data shows that um, in Oneida Lake that only 0.3% um, was comprised of fish. So they, they don't really eat um, a lot of fish. And I know that's what some people worry about when you start seeing these fish out there. So here's just a really close up of, uh, of some of those, those bony scutes. Uh, this one's a juvenile and I put it in there because um, you know ju juveniles have these razor sharp scutes and, and they'll cut you. Um, they are truly like a razor. Um, and they're for protection uh, when, they, when they need it, when they're small. And they usually dull down with age. Um, and then the fine food, you know, sturgeon um, kind of rely on two systems. Uh, those barbels that we talked about, much like a catfish that are uh, chemical receptors, so they can taste the, the water and, and what's around it and in it. Um, and then on the, the, this picture on the left here, this line drawing, you can see these pits under, the, under their snout. You can kind of see them on that sturgeon picture to the right. But these are, um, these are called ampullae of Lorenzini uh, and they're electrical receptors. Um, so um, essentially another similarity with sharks, right? So sharks have those. So envision these things cruising around, um, you know, using both chemo and electro receptors, trying to seek out those, uh, those aquatic insects on the bottom, you know, before that big mouth shoots down like you saw in the video. Now, one thing I want to just mention, and, and I don't have a, a picture here in the slide, but coloration. So you'll see the juveniles, um, you know, have a very different pattern than adults. And, and historically, um, they actually thought they were two different species. Um, so ju juveniles will be modeled. Uh, they have these big black blotches um, and it, it serves as camouflage in shallow water. Um, and then the adults, as they age, turn yellowish brown to gray as adults. So here's another one of Jen's pics of an adult sturgeon. You can see that big fleshy tubular mouth extended. Um, you know, they don't have any teeth at all. Um, that feels um, kind of rubbery, um, kind of like a, a sucker or carp mouth. So there's no uh, fears there from the public that, you know, we often hear, you know, do they have teeth? You know, they do not. They might, might you know, try to gum you, that's about it. So let's talk about uh, differences between males and females. So again, they're long lived, but they're late maturing. So males spawn first uh, between the ages of 18 and 15 years old. On average, they males spawn every other year. 
um, with some males uh, spawning annually. The males have a lifespan of 40 plus years, so it's a bit shorter than females. Uh, they live fast and die young um, sort of life strategy here. So females, uh, they first spawn uh, between the ages of 17 and 25, um, so, so pretty late. And, and even then, uh, when they do reach uh, sexual maturity, they only spawn every three to five years thereafter. Um, and the big fish are, are usually female, so they can live to be, you know, over 80 years. Any fish over 100 is certainly female. Um, so you can see there the, the size. So that was a six foot one fish that we caught um, in Messina, big female. So why are sturgeon in peril? Oh, this is kind of a, a you know, a tragedy story. Um, they were harvest, harvested to excess beginning in, in late 19th century. And in the next few slides, I'll show you, kind of dig into the data a bit and show you some of that, um, that train wreck that happened. So initially, uh, sturgeon were a nuisance fish that followed nets while fishermen were targeting other fish. Uh, and then the market developed for their meat and caviar. Um, and, and, you know, that was kind of the nail in the coffin for them, you know, as far as the overfishing. Um, as we discussed, they're very slow to reproduce and, and slow to recover. Um, through damming, um, they lost access to their spawning grounds, um, which, you know, obviously is a, a kind of a, a cumulative insult here. Um, but dams, you know, not only block the passage of fish upstream to those riffle areas, but often dams are built right at the base of, of large riffles and rivers. Um, so they can kind of maximize that impounded water, um, you know, for hydropower and that sort of thing. So directly impacting spawning sites. Uh, and then lastly, pollution. And, you know, that can range from siltation and poor land use practices that smother spawning beds to uh, chemically impacting um, and reducing aquatic insects that sturge, sturge and feed on. So in short, you know, it seems we did everything possible to stack the get deck against the species. Um, let me back up here, I got click happy. Um, all right, so again, these next few slides are um, an example from Lake Erie, but where landings data exist, this story is exactly the same in almost every water body. So we'll use this one as an example. So this is a report from 1925, an annual report um, to the US commissioner uh, of fisheries. Um, so this ex excerpt out of the book, or out of the report, I mean, says sturgeon were first made use of in Lake Erie, um, where they were marketable as early as 1860. The catch of the species in 1885 uh, amounted to nearly 5 million pounds. But after 1890, so just five years later, uh, production fell rapidly. And in 1922, only 15,000 pounds were reported. So drastic reductions. So here it is 1925 and in the same report, um, a bit of an after action report, um, they listed impacts to fishing and that's the title. And they said over harvest, dams, pollution and lack of inter jurisdictional consistency. So that's different rules between states and, and countries. Um, so they acknowledged absolutely all the problems um, but just a tad bit too late. So this figure shows the landings that were described previously, and you can see where 1925 fits there on the chart, um, kind of after the dust settled. Uh, my colleague, John Suica and his co-authors um, kind of dug into this a bit and knowing the landings um, in the sturgeon life history, they used a model to try to back calculate what those exploitation rates or harvest rates were. Um, so their results showed that you know, at the height of the Lake Erie sturgeon fishery, the harvest rate was as high as 37% of the population, which is just, you know, mind blowing, right? So we know today that a sustainable harvest rate on a healthy sturgeon population can only sustain about two and a half percent of the population annually. You know, so they were over, overfishing by orders of magnitude, um, resulting in this population crash. And why, I don't know. Um, I don't know if it was short-sightedness, if it was uh, not, under, not understanding the species life history or, you know, or it was greed, I'm just, I don't know. Um, so why care? Um, you know, that's always a question, um, especially to sportsmen that wanna see um, what little money we spend on uh, um, sturgeon propagation to go toward a, a game species that they can come home and eat. Um, so there's roughly 25 species worldwide um, 63% are listed as critically endangered. 
um, four of those species are possibly extinct. And that's why the, uh, the kind of uncertainty around that number. Um, here in, the, here in uh, North America, we have nine species of sturgeon. Six of those are, are listed uh, federally under the Endangered Species Act. And what I always try to tell people, and, and it kind of you know, opens your eyes a bit, is, and it hits me when you think about, but sturgeon have been around for 200 million years. Uh, and then within roughly one human generation or a span of about 100 years, we almost wiped them from the globe. Um, and I'm not talking just about lake sturgeon, I'm talking about all sturgeon globally you know, as, as a group. Um, sorry about that. Um, so sturgeon are, are culturally important to indigenous nations. Uh, we know that. Here's a picture here. Um, you know, we do a lot of work with the St. Regis Mohawk tribe um, and that, you know, that these fish are very important uh, to that community. Um, lake sturgeon are a good indicator species for ecosystem function and water quality. And then uh, I have invasive species control with a question mark. And, you know, um, I'm of the mindset that if we had historical abundances of lake sturgeon and American eel uh, in the St. Lawrence and Lake Ontario, that invasive species like round goby and zebra mussels would have had a much harder time getting established. And lastly, uh, again, I might be a little biased, but I just think they're stinking cool. Um, they're very cool animals. So on a management and recovery planning, so the sturgeon fishery in New York uh, kind of, you saw, you know, collapsed and then it kind of petered along that people were allowed to fish for them. Um, and probably it wasn't worth fishing for them because there wasn't that many, but it did peter along and was officially closed in 1976. Um, the species was listed uh, by New York State as threatened in 1993, 1983. And that's where it uh, still is today, a threatened species. Um, and again, no federal protection as of yet. And in New York, I don't think that's needed. Um, so the federal doesn't look at, um, you know, a specific area like uh, geographic or uh, political boundaries like New York State. They look at the species uh, range as a whole. And, and I really think um, here in New York, we got some success stories to share. So, I mean, I don't think it would uh, reach that level, but we'll take a look at the data. Um, across the river in Ontario, uh, the Great Lakes and Upper St. Lawrence population was listed as endangered in 2017. And so I love old pictures. Um, and that's where we have to look to find, you know, big sturgeon. And, uh, you know, our, our, our generation today, I mean, we just don't know what a healthy sturgeon population looks like here in New York. Uh, places like Wisconsin, they have some of those, um, but they're a bit foreign to us. So this picture um, shows Norman uh, Truesdell. Uh, picture was taken by Fred, uh, his brother, in 1949 with the St. Lawrence River lake sturgeon that's labeled as seven feet and 235 pounds. Uh, and he has another measurement there of a 44 inch girth and he's hauling that thing into his rowboat by himself, which is no small feat. So the first recovery plan in New York was written in 1994 by Dean Bowden. Uh, the, one of the first rare fish uh, coordinators. Um, it was modified in 2000 uh, and again in 2005 by Doug Carlson. And the most current plan that we're working off of was written in 2018 by uh, Lisa Holst, uh, the current rare fish uh, unit leader um, and, and a handful of us from this um, Sturgeon work group. Um, so the goal of this recovery plan is to perpetuate uh, the perpetuation of the species in the state. We don't wanna see it disappear. Uh, restore self-sustaining populations, um, remove the species from the New York threatened list. Um, and if you have an interest in this, if you just go into Google and type uh, DEC and Lake Sturgeon Recovery Plan, um, you know, you can gain access to it and uh, enjoy all, all 40 pages if you're that interested. So the recovery plan uh, divided the range of Lake Sturgeon in New York into seven management units um, and success um, is defined as six of those seven management units meeting the following metrics, um, recovery metrics. So that, that means success as in delisting, right? So that's the first step is delisting. So to meet those, uh, each one of those management units um, has to meet these metrics of 750 sexually mature adults uh, and uh, evidence of ongoing recruitment. And that'd be measured by the detection of three year classes of wild reproduction in a five year span. So both of those conditions have to be met. And I'll explain why we, we said six of seven um, in a bit. 
So out of the recovery plan, uh, there's some recommended actions and those are enhance or create spawning habitat, uh, increase fish passage and artificial propagation. And, and, and all these uh, actions are being uh, done. Uh, today, I'm just gonna focus on the artificial propagation piece. Um, so as we discussed, they're slow to reproduce and, and you know, that translates to slow to recover. Um, and so stocking provides a jump start to that recovery. So as far as conservation stocking, the DEC is the lead on this effort and the Fish and Wildlife Service became a partner in the early 2000s. Um, and, and the sturgeon egg collection process is a challenging process. And um, um, it's done by a lot of dedicated folks that have uh, kind of struggled through this through the years. Um, and and we'll, we'll kind of walk you through what, what that takes. So how do you get started? Well, we need some fish. Um, so we go out in the St. Lawrence, um, River below Messina, and we use large mesh gill nets uh, to catch them. It doesn't harm sturgeon. Um, we get very little bycatch. These are really big nets. Um, and the only bycatch we see is once in a while we'll catch a big carp. Um, we remove the fish from the nets and haul them back to shore to collect biological data and sort through them. Uh, remember that not all these fish are going to be in spawning conditions. So we have to kind of parse out the ones that, that may be. Um, so in the picture here, I'm trying to, I'll, as I go along, I'll try to recognize some folks that are in the pictures, but this is Roger Clinton on the left and Dave Gordon on the right um, from Region 6 DC, and they've been a part of this for, for a long time. So this is our sturgeon base camp that we operate for a few um, weeks a year, and we set up alongside the river. Um, New York Power Authority provides us access and security, and, and they've been a great partner um, throughout this effort. Um, so you can see we have three large tanks there. Uh, one, the larger tank is for females. Uh, the two smaller tanks are for males and those have recircula or uh, pumps that, that circulate water from the river up through the tanks and then back to the river. Uh, for genetic diversity, we target three to five females per, and 20 males per year. Uh, we use this little, little utility trailer here on site for our field lab. So we conduct some progesterone assays and sperm motility work uh, essentially microscope work there in the lab. So here, you know, we get a female that, again, if you've been around this work for a while, you can kind of uh, roll a female sturgeon over and kind of touch their belly and, and you can make some predictions of, of whether or not it's, it's ripe or not. They have a certain feel to them. So what we do then is we put them in this tub, their head submerged and they're kind of angled out of the water. And we use this thing in the lower left here called a hypodermic egg extractor. Um, so it's basically a big hypodermic needle hooked to aquarium tubing and a, and a, a syringe. And so we'll make a small hole uh, and insert that and extract 20 plus eggs uh, from the female. Uh, this is less invasive than what we used to do, which was make a small surgical incision, sample the eggs and then and put a couple stitches in. Um, to close her up. Uh, this, this egg extractor uh, entry point uh, is healed up within a day. Um, we can barely uh, tell that we've, we've done it uh, if we recapture the fish. Um, so then we take the eggs to uh, determine uh, the stage the eggs are in, uh, meaning how close they are to spawn. So we know those fish are only spawning every three to five years. And if you looked at eggs every year from a, a spawning female, you could see the different stages and what sort of development they're in because those fish are developing it takes so much resources to make that many eggs that they're developing over, over multiple seasons. So to gauge the female's readiness to spawn, we conduct, conduct this progesterone assay on the eggs. Uh, it's essentially a paired trial with a control. So we add progesterone to half the eggs and the other half is just uh, saline. Um, they incubate for about 18 hours, and then we hard boil them and section them. So that's where you're seeing this upper, upper left here, little uh, sturgeon um, hard boiled eggs. Um, by looking at the egg structure, we can determine if the female's ready or and if she isn't, you know, how many weeks away she is from spawning. Um, it, it's pretty, uh, a pretty slick process. So this is Jeff, Jeff Eckerlin here uh, working in the trailer. Um, he's with the uh, DEC's pathology lab. He's the keystone of this operation. Um, so unlike uh, you know, other fish commonly spawn like walleye and that sort of thing, you just haul them out of the water and give them a squeeze and out come eggs and, and things are good. Um, we don't catch sturgeon on their spawning grounds. So they're green or hard. Um, you know, they don't give up their eggs readily. So we have to help 
push them over the edge and induce them to spawn. So we use this tried and true method of injecting them with a carp pituitary hormone. So this hormone pushes them over the edge and uh, gets them to release their eggs. Um, so this method's been used on many species around the world. Uh, there's even a Peace Corps manual on the topic, you know, for tilapia, you know, for food fishes. And it's, it's a very uh, um, mild uh, hormone. And so this insert picture here is of the, a picture of some vials. Of, um, those are whole uh, carp pituitary glands uh, removed from carp in spawning condition. So it's that easy. You go out and see a carp, it's in spawning condition, they catch them, you know, obviously have to kill them and then remove um, their pituitary gland and dry them through acetone and, and freeze dry them and that sort of thing. And then we grind these basically into powder uh, mixed with water um, for injection. So when we start this injection process, you know, roughly 30 hours after the process has started, uh, the females will begin to release their eggs. So if things go as planned, this is what we see on egg tape. Um, again, these fish are big, they're not walleyes. Um, they require many hands um, to, to conduct this process. So we found it best for the fish and the staff uh, if we put one body in the tank. So someone's wearing waders and right in the tank with the females and they kind of support the, the main portion of the body. And then several others are uh, kind of wrestling the head and tail. Uh, and then this person's job is critically important. They stick a dry bowl onto that fish and hang on for dear life because that's, that's the most important part of the task. Um, so females can have uh, upwards of 500,000 to a million eggs each. Um, they're kind of case strategists, right? They have very small eggs. So they, uh, um, they just broadcast them out and, and play the numbers game. Um, so these fish, you know, having that many eggs, they don't release them all at once in the wild. Um, they have multiple spawning bouts. Um, so we have to do that in captivity even when we induce them. So we'll cycle through these fish three or four times throughout the day and we'll get, you know, a quarter of a bowl each time. And then we, we crossbreed them with different males to kind of increase uh, genetic uh, parentage. Um, so that's the, the strategy there. So then we water activate the sperm. I didn't show pictures, but uh, the males are, are roaring uh, ready to go. And we, we actually, first part of the day, we extract the milk from them uh, in the dry, so it's not activated. And then we put those on uh, vials on ice. Um, so then we'll, we'll water activate it, um, add it to a bowl of sturgeon eggs. And then, you know, that sperm, once water activated, uh, is only viable for about a minute and a half, which if you saw in that video, when they spawn, you know, a minute and a half is overkill in the wild. But, um, you know, that's created some problems from us in the past with fertility and that sort of thing. So we have to keep a keen eye on that. So here's a bowl, looks like we're mixing it in mud. Um, it is. So fertilized eggs uh, exude this adhesiveness uh, when they're fertilized and under natural conditions in a flowing river, it's, a, it's an adaptation, right? So they don't want to get washed downstream. So the minute they get fertilized, they start getting sticky. And the minute they hit something, they stick. And then over time, that adhesiveness goes away and they fall between the rocks. Predators can't get them. <clears throat> so obviously that works for them in the natural setting, but under uh, hatchery settings, this creates a huge problem. Um, we can't have sticky eggs in a big block, right? So we add this fuller's earth, which is basically very fine clay. And it kind of gums up that adhesiveness. And over time, as the egg keeps exuding it, it strips it off. Um, so again, essentially, so we don't have those big clumps when they, uh, when they head out to the, to the hatchery. And like all, I don't know the significance of this, um, but um, every hatchery I've ever been to seems to use uh, turkey feathers. And I think there's some tradition between the, uh, the hatchery guys, but that's what we use as well. Uh, eggs are then treated with an iodine bath uh, and that kills any bacteria and viruses prior, prior to their trip to the hatcheries uh, and biosecurity is a really important task. So even when they get to the hatcheries, they're put in isolation um, until they hatch and then they're, some are set off for disease testing to ensure they're clean, that we don't contaminate the hatchery. And thus far, you know, at two hatcheries, everything's been uh, good. We've not had any close calls. So eggs are then loaded into these Ziploc bags, um, topped off with oxygen. They're floated in water inside of a cooler to help buffer those temperatures in transit. Uh, and then we ship, um, well, you can see that it looks muddy again. So we add some of that Fuller's Earth back to them just to ensure they don't get sticky along their, 
their travel. And then eggs are split between two hatcheries. So fish are raised at the DEC Oneida Fish Cultural Station in Constantia, New York uh, by Bill Evans and his crew. And then some, fish are, some eggs are sent out to our US Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Genoa National Fish Hatchery in Genoa, Wisconsin. Uh, that's run by Doug Aloisi and his crew. And at that point, um, we've handed them off to the experts at the hatcheries and, and we are, our, um, our nervousness and, and pacing is kind of over and, and now it's their turn. So they, uh, they diligently uh, watch over these and feed them um, and, and take uh, excellent care of them. And then if we fast forward four months, and this is what we hope to see. So this is another one of Jen shots underwater that's actually spectacular. It doesn't even look like it's in water. Um, so we take that on, on, on average, uh, eggs are taken that first week of June or so. And then by the end of September, early October, um, we have six and a half to seven and a half inch long sturgeon fingerlings to stock. And they're little cuties. I mean, you can see those blotch patterns, but they're, they're adorable. So what are our annual stocking targets and where do we stock? So uh, if we start to the west and, and head kind of east and then northeast and just kind of follow the river from, uh, from Rochester, kind of like you were flowing right up and out of the St. Lawrence, uh, we stock the Genesee River, uh, Cayuga Lake, Oneida Lake, Black Lake, uh, the Oswagatchee River, and the St. Lawrence uh, proper or main stem right there at Ogdensburg. And this is a recent uh, collaboration on Ontario power generation uh, as part of their um, hydro mitigation. And then the Racket River, uh, St. Regis River and the Salmon River up in Franklin County. So that's roughly about 14,000 sturgeon fingerlings a year. So both hatcheries, you know, we give them a bunch of eggs and they, um, and try to raise them as many as they can. And oftentimes we end up, um, they take a calculation kind of midsummer and say, whoa, we got too many fish. And, and we call those surplus fish and we'll stock those out uh, midsummer at a smaller size, uh, two to four inches. And obviously those have a lower survivorship. Um, but the places we tend to put those are um, St. Lawrence um, below the dam in Messina there and uh, Chameau Bay. Where do we stand after all this, right? So to date, you know, since 1993, there's been 300,000, over 300,000 sturgeon stocked in New York waters. Um, we've confirmed that of the stocked fish, um, we've confirmed spawning of those stocked fish in four water bodies in New York. So Oneida Lake, Cayuga Lake, um, Black Lake, and the Oswagatchee River. There's been ripe males and females captured in the Seneca River and the Genesee River. And this is a bit of an arms race, right? So those fish have been mature and it's a matter of, you know, proving that, that, that those offsprings are the offspring are there. So it's a matter of catching them. Don Dittman's doing a fine job uh, with USGS and, and she has a couple that are suspect that she thinks are. Um, so obviously these next, those, those two bullets are a big accomplishment as you learned um, that we have to wait almost 20 years to see the success of either wild offspring or, or mature adults. So you got to stay at this for a bit. Um, the DC and, and Fish and Wildlife Service Conservation Stocking Partnership will continue through uh, 2024 and, and possibly beyond. Um, we'll see how that goes. So this is um, the recovery dashboard um, from the Lake Sturgeon Population Status Assessment Report um, that was released last week. Um, there's a lot packed in here. Um, but if we just focus on the columns, uh, the first one's management unit. So there are the seven management units outlined. Um, the next two are those goal metrics, right? The adult and the reproduction component. Um, so that adult, again, is 750 um, spawning adults or mature adults. That reproduction is, is kind of proving recruitment of three naturally produced year classes in a five-year period. And then if those two uh, columns get a green check mark, uh, the unit's recovered and gets a check mark. So if we start down that right column, a unit recovery, uh, Lake Erie and Western Lake Ontario are recovered. The next two red X's are Central New York and Eastern Lake Ontario. And, you know, you can look across and see there's been some success, uh, reproduction goals, and just, you know, for Central New York, you know, we're just not there at the adult uh, number yet. And as we, as these fish start to, these stocked fish start to recruit to those uh, adult sizes, um, obviously there'll be a, a better chance. 
uh, of checking this box. And then uh, the one I highlighted was the Upper St. Lawrence River. Um, so that uh, the DEC sent out a press release last week that announced that the, Sturge, the Upper St. Lawrence um, has been recovered. Uh, the Lower St. Lawrence River and then Lake Champlain. Um, and Lake Champlain is, is the reason we didn't say seven out of seven for delisting because all the good historic spawning habitat has been in Vermont. Um, so there's not really a whole lot we can do there. Vermont's working on the task. Um, they're right now hesitant to do any stocking. So they're just gonna let natural, uh, at this point, natural uh, recovery happen on its own. So where are we going from here? Uh, and John, don't panic, um, I'm wrapping up here. Um, so we're gonna continue efforts to document spawning and locate spawning sites, uh, both wild and stocked fish. Uh, determine levels of recruitment from those stock fish and from the habitat restoration projects. Uh, continue our conservation stocking efforts, at least through 2024, maybe beyond. Um, continue to monitor natural populations for trends. What we don't want is a, a population that we think is good kind of slip backwards on us. Um, so we'll keep tabs on that. Uh, continue to update the species population status assessment. And, and as a group, uh, or through our sturgeon working group, uh, work toward uh, delisting of the species. So in closing, I'll close with this, that we've done a lot of bad things to the species and yet it survived. I mean, they are complete survivors. Um, the resiliency is, is absolutely amazing. Uh, this picture Jen took is of my son, Sam. Um, this picture gives me hope uh, that through the work of our of dedicated partners that we're ensuring that Lake Sturgeon will be around for future generations like his. Um, so with that, I, I take any questions. Lauren, do you have some questions? I have lots. Uh, oh the, first, <laughs> the first one is, um, how do you age a fish? Oh, geez. Um, yeah, so, I mean, all fish are aged uh, differently, but essentially, uh, you know, for fish with bony structures, uh, folks look at scales, uh, they look at otoliths. Um, so sturgeon um, uh, don't have scales we can age. Uh, the rotoliths kind of develop odd because they're a primitive fish. Um, so what we tend to do is take a, uh, their, their pectoral fins, those side fins up by their head. You can take the leading edge of that and take a cross section. And um, um, you can dry that and section it and read them just like rings on a tree. And I'll try when I leave here, I'll try, I don't know if I can do this, but I'll try to post one in the, uh, the chat, um, what it looks like under a microscope, but it's pretty... Um, Pretty easy to do and, and pretty clear for, uh, for aging until they get old. Um, a fish over hundred years is, is pretty difficult to age and any way you slice it. But. Thanks. Uh, the second question, there were a couple more that just came in. The second question is what are the greatest current threats to stocked and natural fish? Is it predation, is it pollution or something else? Yeah, um, there's been some pollution work done. Um, these primitive fish are, um, are tough. Um, like I said, they're survivors and we, we don't see pollution having a, a big effect on them, obviously. I mean, fish, um, you know, there's Lake Sturgeon that made it through the worst of Lake Erie's times, right? Which, uh, which says something. Um, I would say the biggest threats right now, um, you know, we beat them down to submission. We, we've covered their, or blocked their spawning access um, and, and, and that pollution component. When you think of I think of Lake Erie and, and uh, when I mentioned their food sources, think of uh, the big hexagenia burrowing mayflies, right? And, and how we see those are coming back. Um, so when you start looking at all the threats, you know, we've closed the season, so we're not overfishing them. Uh, the pollution um, is getting better. Um, and, and then we start talking about habitat and we're trying to do some things to restore habitat, increasing fish passage. And with that, you know, it might be a long time before they recover, but we're trying to jumpstart them. Um, so I think um, the unknown threats to me are, you know, what impacts round gobies are having, um, you know, on eggs, you know, these spawning beds that we put in, we see fish show up, spawn, and we don't see a lot of evidence of the young yet. Um, so we're, that's something we have to unravel a bit. Yeah. Uh, the next question has a couple different parts. Um, <laughs> The first bit is what can save the river do to help the revival of sturgeon in the river? The second part of that is how can the average citizen be involved and how can scuba divers be involved? Yeah, yeah, those are all good questions. And 
I'm grateful that people want to get involved. Um, as far as save the river to start kind of higher arc early and go down is that keep doing what you're doing. Um, having the people on the landscape looking uh, for con uh, contamination and pollution, um, those are, are huge efforts and you might not be able to, to hang a hat on, it affects sturgeon, but it affects the entire river, which, which sturgeon are part of, right? And then, uh, you know, the average citizen, um, just uh, be supportive. Um, you know, there's, like I said, there's folks out there that if you can't eat them, you know, they don't really want an interest um, and want to see money spent elsewhere. And again, the, the program doesn't spend a lot, um, but just being supportive um, is helpful. And then as far as divers, um, you know, we used to have a, a, a diver reporting sighting um, program with the Fish and Wildlife Service out in the Niagara River, and it gave us a lot of good information. You know, at this point, um, we don't have a formal program, but, um, you know, if you wanted to ping me, that'd be fine. If you want to tell someone and you're excited about it, you know, I'd be happy to hear it. And I do keep track of that stuff, uh, especially in the upper St. Lawrence. That's great. That's good that options for question. everybody. Yeah. Uh, we've got a couple more questions. Uh, one of them is what percentage of sturgeon reach reproductive maturity? Yeah, it's not a, like I said, they're kind of this case strategist, right? Um, so they, they put out a lot of eggs and play the odds game um, and, and not many of them do. So, um, you know, with that being said though, um, these hatchery fish, well, we can jumpstart them. Um, studies have shown that if you can get a sturgeon to 10 inches, um, they have over a 98% uh, one year survival rate after you stock them, which is just crazy. You know, no other fish, you know, I don't know, I don't know what it is for walleyes um, and some other species, but it's got to be down in the, you know, 15, 20% or so range, I would think. And our fish, when we put them in at six and a half, seven inches, you know, they're in that 70%. Um, that's one year survivorship, right? And the bigger they get, the lower that number or the higher the survivorship on an annual basis goes. So I, I couldn't give you an exact number, but, you know, once they get the full size, um, you know, the, the, um, Mortality is pretty low, natural mortality. As I said, you know, we know that only two and a half percent, if you go above that um, for harvest or exploitation annually, the population starts to decline. So it's, it, it's relatively low. Sorry, I can't answer that one specifically. <laughs> uh, the other question is years ago, we thought sturgeon uh, were close to extinction. Um, where were they rediscovered and by whom? Mm, that's a good question. So, I mean, obviously that's a story about every fish, right? Every sturgeon around the globe, but here in New York, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't, uh, couldn't include everything, but ultimately that, that population below the dam in Messina that are really Canadian fish running up to us, um, you know, that's been a, a, a stalwart through all this. Um, and, and, you know, over that time, it's had indigenous um, harvests and been, you know, um, harvested at a, a low rate that they're, they're still maintaining um, their population levels. And we use those as the brood stock. So that population has always been good. Um, and then they were kind of sparse on the landscape. So there's other places like the Niagara River uh, and the Black River um, where populations, those remnant populations are just naturally recovering. And, you know, some of my colleagues like Dmitry Gorsky out in the Lower Great Lakes, um, Fish and Wildlife Office um, is doing work in the Niagara River. And those populations, they're seeing kind of recover on their own. Um, but again, it's going to take a lot of years. Um, but there's a lot of bright spots to, to focus on. Not sure if they answered it. Uh, I think, let me just double check. You're probably pretty late. I think that's, that's about all the You're questions. You're right on time, Scott. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Right? Very good. Uh, and I appreciate, I enjoyed it. And if anyone has any questions, um, you know, just ping John and, you know, you can get my email and, and I'd be happy to follow up with anyone. And I want to thank you and, and Jen Hayes too. I know Jen was going to try to be with us and couldn't be with us today. So thank her for her part in that. And just in closing, I have to tell you my curiosity about sturgeon started when I was about 10 years old and I was snorkeling out in front of our island in the main channel and in those days, the turbidity was so high that you couldn't see the bottom. That was before 
all the damage that's been caused by the, uh, the invasive species. But I ran into a fish that was probably four or five feet long and yeah. it startled me. I knew it wasn't sure. a catfish. I didn't think it was a muskie or a pike. And it took me years to realize that I'd had a face-to-face -face encounter with a, a beautiful yeah. sturgeon. So That's there's, incredible. They're an, well, they're an amazing part of the river. And I, I'm glad that yeah. you and others are doing such great work on them. So thank you very much.